The discovery of antibiotics have been one of the great discoveries of the 20th century. Alexander Fleming in 1928 has the Petri dish with the Staphylococcus on it and leaves it out and the mold goes on the Staphylococcus and kills the Staphylococcus. But penicillin doesn't get made on any large scale um, until the 1940s, but really as a collaborative effort between the British and the American pharmaceutical industry. It's really in the midst of World War II, is an incredible collaboration that, that generates penicillin on a large scale. And the first three broad spectrum antibiotics are Lederle's oreomycin, which is core tetracycline, Park Davis's chlorophenicol, and Pfizer's teramycin. The antibiotics truly were a revolution. It also transforms drug marketing itself. So these were internal documents from the, from the um, National Archives, at the Federal, from the Federal Trade Commission at the National Archives, showing early drug detailing during these tetracycline wars, as it were. This one says, easy prey for teramycin. Those prey are physicians. <laughs> The overall ping pong ball is one of the most effective detailing pieces yet given us. Doctors are amused by this device and usually want more of them. It's not a proud moment for my profession. Just to be clear, they're talking about an actual ping pong ball handout. Yes. <laughs> These drug detailing campaigns were, were conducted and described in the language of military combat. Holding the line in the hospitals is a 24-hour ulcer. By and large, we're in good shape, but the sniping is terrific. Approximately one half of the region will blitz Memphis, the other half will blitz Birmingham simultaneously. So it really is a war to peddle antibiotics. This, it, it was really described and conceived as such. The outcome is massive antibiotic usage. You had all these blood spectrum antibiotics, and you had to state why one was better than the other one. So this ad states, Doctor, why is oreomycin best? Well, it achieves better results with lower dosages, with less likely that disease germs will build up immunity to its health-restoring powers. So this is a claim right in the early 1950s that you have the perfect drug, no side effects, no antibiotic resistance. And look at how wise and comforting this doctor <laughs> yes, is. Yes, yes. How could he be wrong? Imagine this, you know, uh, you can fit a billion bacteria on the head of a pin. And if those bact billion bacteria were in one tiny little area of your lung, I mean, maybe a centimeter squared area of your lung, it can kill you. So what do we do? We take antibiotics, which are made by other bacteria. We make a metric ton of it, and then we inject it into your body so that that antibiotic goes everywhere. Not to that little area that's making you sick, but everywhere. It goes into your brain, in your tongue, in your ear fluid, in your urine, just blast it everywhere. And not surprisingly, antibiotic resistance has emerged. This is the first use of the term superbug that I've ever found in an article from Look Magazine titled, mm -hmm. Are Germs Winning the War Against People? Dr. E.S. Anderson of Britain's Public Health Service has even found a superbug that carries resistance to more than seven powerful antibacterial agents, streptomycin, tetracycline, chlorophenicol, sulfonamides, neomycin, canamycin, and the penicillins. Antibiotic winter is a concept that I'm really concerned about. Our microbiome, which protects us against invaders, is being degraded. Uh, we have lots of antibiotic-resistant organisms. It, it, it's, it's like a perfect storm uh, waiting to happen. And if it happens tomorrow, we're cooked. It's too late. But if, if it's going to happen 50 years from now, uh, maybe we should prepare. And we should figure out how we can turn that around so that having a giant interconnected global village of 7 billion people, we're not at risk.